We left El Velado, the district where we were, which is part of uh, Plaza de la Revolution, to meet uh, Playa. We're in Playa, municipality right now. Look at the homes, most of them built in the early, really coming on the 20th century. There's a lot of Art Deco, neoclassical architecture, parts of Art Nouveau, also. Real estate became one of the most lucrative business of Cuba with, when they took down the walls and they started developing the areas outside of the walls. And the speculation behind it is the one that actually uh, populated these areas outside. It's, you see, it was so easy to buy land and so cheap to buy land in Havana in the second half of the 19th century that you could get 100 acres of land for only 70 pesos gold. Then the people would divide that land into plots and build these big tent mansions and palaces and sell them for a very good price. Are there any plans to build uh, really modern architecture in Havana? We have some modern buildings being built now, hotels mostly. That's been built now, but you know, tourism is the number one industry of Cuba. So the hotels that are being built look very hard. Those do look very hard. This is one of those districts that was very rich. Holly was the name of the district where the very important people, very wealthy people used to live. Still today, here, a lot of wealthy people live in this area. Families that inherited uh, money from before Castro. And that's how we say BC before Castro. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the still. So do these people have to pay more taxes? Or do these people have to pay more taxes only if they own a certain business? Remember, average Cubans are not. Will not pay taxes. The only people who pay taxes are those who own business. So if it happens to be that some family here owns a business, they have to pay tax for the business. If they don't, it's not a problem. But it's okay for them to be yes, it's okay. richer, richer, richer than we are. We've had rich people always. They never managed to. The revolution came to with the idea that all Cubans were equal, that we were going to be equal after that. We'll have equal same opportunities. In the case of opportunities, yes, we did have access to the same opportunities, but in the case of being uh, the same in terms of wealth, no. Because there were families that were always rich and kept a lot of their money after the revolution. So, and people are different, you know. Equality is, uh, is a utopia. Because people are different everywhere you go. People yep. are different. I had this teacher at the university who used to uh, give us this example. He said, uh, take five people. Right? Different people. And give them a million dollars each. And wait till the course of one year passes. You will see that one person will invest 500000 in a business. You will see that another person will donate 300000 to a charity. And then you will see another person that will drink and smoke the million dollars in six months. Because people are different. Even though you give them the same opportunities, right? Exactly. They will do different. Yep. Okay? So it's not achievable that sort of equality is not cheap. But the intention was there to balance inflation with more opportunities in education, healthcare, and so on. But even with free education, there's people in Cuba that decide not to go to college. You know, that's the opportunity is there, but some people decide, decide not to take it. So that leaves you behind an escape. Some people are just more clever than others, more successful than others. That's true. That's what it is. It is what it is. What is the crime rate in Cuba? It's actually the lowest in the Caribbean. It's actually in Cuba. Yeah, it's a very safe country. We don't have gun permits in Cuba. No gun permits in Cuba. You never hear about people getting shot in the streets of Cuba. Never. Is it true that you guys are encouraged not to contact the tourists or not to 
Is it true that we are encouraged not to contact the tourists? No, it's the other way around. Actually, uh, tourism is our number one industry, so uh, we need tourists. Okay? So, uh, has it always been our number one since the 1990s? It has been our number one. In the crisis of the 90s, in the middle of the crisis of the 90s, when Cuba was, uh, imagine an airplane in plain flight, losing, suddenly losing the engines. It went down. That's what happened to the Cuban economy in the 90s. We used to import 18 million tons of diesel from the Soviet republics. And then when it all collapsed, from 18 million tons to only 4 million tons. So you imagine the crisis, no transportation, no electricity, blackouts every day, 10 hours, 18 hours, 16 hours a day. So it was a disaster for Cuba. Then tourism in the 1994, 1995, became the engine of the Cuban economy, the economy to bring the country out of the price. So that's industry number one. Industry number two for Cuba today is medical services. We train a lot of doctors and we have medical agreements with different countries and that makes a lot of money for Cuba. Number three industry is nickel that is mined here in Cuba on the eastern part of the country. So Cuba is today the fifth world producer of nickel. So it's a big industry for Cuba. Then number four is a combination of tobacco and rum. So those are the four basic industries of Cuba. Where did I learn English? At the University of Cuba. And, and English is studied in Cuba since primary school. So it's uh, the language I was studying. Now, Spanish is our native language. I mean, the foreign language that we study at school, like Spanish would be in America for, um, you know, like a complementary subject. The, the, the one that we study here is English. What percentage of the human people speak English? It would be, I don't know the exact number, but it would be really high. People <laughs> Bienvenidos amigos, muchísimas gracias. Vamos familia, un poquito de alta en el monitor turno. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Sean todos bienvenidos al, al Capri. Somos la orquesta Carlos Vargas y Habana Swing, Habana Light. Espero disfruten de su almuerzo al igual que de nuestra música. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the Capri. We are. Carlos Vargas, Yavana Light, Group. We hope enjoy your lunch and our music. Thank you. Have a nice day. El video del pianista, sí. Acá, pasa por ahí.
of the Atlantic coast, the Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico, Cuba was considered, for the Spaniards, the key to the Gulf. That's how they used to refer to Cuba. Because of that uh, strategic position of the island in that confluence of three big bodies of water. For that reason, Havana was the main port of call for all Spanish vessels during colonial times. So whenever Spanish ships came from South American colonies loaded with all the gold, all the gold and the silver and many other precious materials they brought from the colonies, that wealth was stored in Havana before being shipped back to Spain. For that reason, the Spaniards decided to fortify the sea as to protect it from the attacks of pirates and corsairs, all right? Then Havana today has the largest fortification system in the Americas. It's precisely located in this city because all the wealth of the Spanish em Empire from the, from the colonies was stored here, okay? 
There was a very famous pirate, Jack the Source, French pirate, who attacked Havana in the year 1555 and then uh, took, down, took all the gold and the silver of the city, burned down the whole city, and then he left. After that event, the Spanish crown decided to stop using wood to build homes and fortresses in Havana. And they started using limestone, which is the local, the basic rock of Cuba, right? For that purpose. So the fortification system of Havana is mostly built using limestone. Limestone is coral based. It's a coral based rock. It's a very hard rock. Okay? So uh, that's why these fortresses can last for centuries like nothing happened, okay? And we're going to see La Cabana, the most important one. I'm going to tell you the story behind La Cabana when we get to the site. In order to get to the other side of the city, we're in the western coast of Havana right now. We're going to be on the eastern coast, which is that way, on the other side, where the fortress is on. We're going to take the Havana Bay Tunnel. The Havana Bay Tunnel is considered the greatest, or one of the greatest, engineering works of Cuba until the 1950s. Actually, it was completed in 1959 by a French company the name of the company was Grand Travaux de Marseille. It's an active company. Then we have a statue to Maximo Gomez. There he is, Maximo Gomez, the general from the army that we saw at the cemetery. There's a statue to him. That is why also the horse is looking towards the Afani coast. In horse sculpture language, whenever the horse is looking towards the ocean, it means that the person was born outside of the country. And it is the case of Maximo Gomez, who was from the Dominican Republic. If the horse is looking inland, it means it was someone that was born in that country. Okay? In the case of Maximo Gomez, the horse is looking towards the Atlantic Coast because he was not from Cuba. Though he earned the title of the Cuban citizenship, he became citizenship, a citizen uh, afterwards, after his death. Okay? So this is the Havana Bay Town. Completed in 1959, it covers 733 meters below the waters of the Havana Harbor. So we are right now 14 meters below the waters of the Havana Harbor. It was built in order to provide the necessary connectivity between the west and the east of Havana. If we were to take the actual highway that takes us to this side of the city, it would take us 35 minutes to get to the other side. However, less than a minute using the tunnel. You saw? We are ready on the eastern part of Amman. So it was key in the connectivity between these two sections of town.
we can see El Morro, Castle del Castillo, Los Tres Reyes del Morro, in the corner over there, the one with the lighthouse, that dates back to 1589. El Castillo de Tres Reyes del Morro was key in the protection of the city against pirates and poisoners. And together with La Punta on the other side of the harbor, they protected the entrance to the Havana Harbor from pirates and poisoners. We're going to go, instead of coming into the fortress, we're going to go visit the Christ of Havana, okay? Which is on this side too. We're going to go uh, visit the Christ of Havana, which is actually the result of the prayer to God made by Fulgencio Batista's wife in the 1950s. After the revolution started, uh, his, his wife prayed to God that if her husband made it alive out of the revolutionary process that was happening in Cuba, she was going to build uh, a statue of Christ to Havana. And actually, Batista managed to escape the revolution in 1958 after Santa Clara province fell in the hands of the rebels. Uh, he fled the country and went to the Dominican Republic, actually. He flew to the Dominican Republic because he had a good friend in the DR, Mr. Trujillo, who was the president of the Dominican Republic at the time. This is 1958, December. Because him and Trujillo had conducted several business together and he owed Trujillo actually 9 million pesos. And Trujillo, Trujillo accepted to give Batista political asylum, probably thinking to get his money back. This is a little museum, open air museum, before we continue with Batista's story. Open air museum that talks about the 19, 1962 missile crisis in Cuba, okay? When Fidel accepted to install nuclear warheads of Russian manufacturing in the country. So this open air museum talks about that thing. So Batista, after he left Cuba, went to the Dominican Republic, Trujillo accepted the guy, gave him political asylum yeah, there, right. looking to get his money back. However, when he sent his private assistant to pay a visit to Batista, Batista told the man that he had left Cuba as a poor guy, that he had no money to give to Trujillo. And then Trujillo, who knew that this was not true, Batista took a lot of money with him when he left the country, gets mad and kicked Batista out of the Dominican Republic. So he went. He had to fly over to the Portugal and eventually made it to the south of Spain, where he died in Marbella, an island in the south of Spain, in the year 1979, my mind, So that's Batista after he left to uh, Cuba. So the Christ is the result of that prayer made by Pulgesi Batista's wife. It is 20 meters high. It was carved out of 65 pieces of Carrara marble from Italy. Now that is an amazing view.
apparently this house is a museum and for the love of God, dude just said who used to live there and it's a famous artist or something like that. At least I think it is and I'm not there anymore. That's real hard work right there. Open. <laughs> you can't get it open, dude. I took me like and 10 times. Looking. I like the car a little bit better, though. And as you can tell this morning we were over there now in the mid afternoon we're over here this is a great great master shot And this is the spot I was talking about in Fast and the Furious where Vin Diesel was at right when the car had spun out of control. It wasn't on the other side. Once again, it is very, very beautiful out here. Cannot wait to get inside. Because she's strongly denying and shaking her head. <laughs> okay, so um, we find ourselves in La Cavalle, actually the most important fortress in the country, the largest in the Americas. La Cabaña was built after Havana was in British hands. 
for one year. And then um, from 1762 to 63, the Brits took over Havana, uh, Cuba from Havana. What happens is that the Italian architect who was hired by the Spanish crown to design the military fortresses of the country, Juan Bautista Antonelli, had advised the crown that this location on top of the hill needed to be fortified because if the enemy had access to this part, it was going to be very easy for them to take over the settlement. The Spaniards disregarded these comments by Antonelli. And uh, actually, the British proved his theory right in the year 1762. So what they did was to land away from the cannons from El Morro. You saw the one with the lighthouse by the entrance? So they landed almost 900 meters away from the reach of the cannons of El Morro. They came up with their cannons, their own cannons, up to this location. And from here, they took the settlement of Havana, which is right in front of us. That's how easy it was to take over Havana for the Brits. Then the Brits spent 11 months in Cuba. Finally, they decided they had no interest in this island. They ended up trading the island for Florida. So the Spaniards gave Florida to the Brits and they recovered Cuba. All right? Then after that event, the Spanish crown decided to fortify them. As a result, they built the largest fortification in the Americas. 2.5 square kilometers is the total surface of it. Okay? It's the most biggest fortification in the Americas. After that, remember I told you Havana was a dead city. And then, Havana had nine doors within the walls. There were nine doors like in back to the street. And at 9 p.m. every night, they used to blow a cannon shot in order to close the doors and also to close the entrance to the harbor. No ships go, could go in or outside of the harbor. So they used to hang a wooden chain from one end to the other to prevent ships from leaving or entering. Okay? Today we maintain that same tradition. And uh, every night at 9 p.m., they blow a cannon shot from here. 365 days a year happens the cannon shot ceremony. Okay, a lot of people come because the soldiers are right here. This is a military unit, active military unit, and the museum too. The soldiers that are here are dressed in traditional dress, uniforms from that time, and they perform the whole ceremony. Right, and they go to the Of course, today, today we have a black cannon. We have a city on the other side, you don't want to kill somebody yeah. on the Malay board, you know, having a nice time, and then boom! Gone. <laughs> Gone. No, no, it's a blank time. Okay. But the ceremony is done every night. So if you're here tonight at 9 p.m., you hear it. Boom! It's not Third World War, it's just the cannon shot. So, so that's La Cabana Fort. After uh, it was, it costed the Spanish Empire 40 million. And when the king of Spain heard how much it had cost the Spanish Empire, some people say he went out his window with a telescope trying to see the fortress from Spain. Oh they said, such an expensive fortress, I have to see them in my house, you know. I have to from here how much it was. You know? So that's like our the largest of all the fortifications in the Americas. It was, it is part of the second defense system of Havana. One, we had one prior to 1762. And then one after 1763. And now La Cabaña took from 1763 till 1774. The whole process because La Cabaña, right? The largest fortification of the Americas. Now, um, so uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes, okay? To, uh, let's say 15 minutes. So you can walk around, take pictures, okay, mm -hmm. on the site, and then we're going to meet back outside. Then we'll go down to town Havana to the Capitol Square, and we'll make the walk around. Mm -hmm. If you want to see the two longest cigars, remember I told you about the cigars? Yeah. The longest, the world Guinness records? Come here, show me what they
them look like dodgeballs, but uh, they blow people up. Hmm. Oh, tobacco cafe. Boy, you can go in. Those are the two longest cigars in the world. They are world games records. The gentleman who wrote them is over there, the poster over there. Walk around, use the space so everybody can go in. There you are, two longest cigars ever rolled in the world. Apparently this is two cigars, like the man said.
YouTube video. <laughs> This was. I swear I brought a lot of stuff for the trade. I don't know why I was thinking it was water it used to be here. Those cars. How bad it is, no safety harness. Okay, he's holding them up. One big ass church. Epic, good looking church, too.
built by the Jesuits in Cuba. However, Jesuits got kicked out of all Spanish colonies in the year 1767. By the time they were kicked out of Cuba, most of the work was completed. There's one feature missing though in the facade of the building. Do you notice which one it is? Inside the, it's the thing. Oh. Not the window, no, not the cross, not the cross, not the window. Look at the, yeah, the statues. The statues in there. You see the empty meters? They couldn't finish that part of the, of the work because they got kicked out. What happens is that they responded to the interest of the Vatican. That caused a lot of tension between the crown and Jesuits. And they got kicked out of all Spanish colonies in that year, 1767. It's a beautiful Baroque style facade, okay? The interior though is completely neoclassic. Now, this was a swamp that was dried out and refilled in order to build a proper church for the city. And then, once they built the church, the people who had the money decided to go in the house surrounding the church. This is the case of all these houses here, okay? That are museums today, but that belong to the very wealthy people of Havana. Now, if you look at the facade of the building again, there is a large difference between the size of the two bell towers. Do you see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are two theories related to that fact. Theory number one tells us that when Jesuits started building the church, they started from the right to the left. But when they, got, they were approaching this part, there was already a street and the house being built that blocked their way. So they were forced to re reduce the size of the second bell tower. Now, theory number two is related to how religion influences architecture. Because according to the Bible, Jesus Christ sits by the right hand side of God on the table. Isn't that right? So, when you look at the building from the front, you're looking at the, a representation of the Holy Trinity. In the center, you have the Father. The Son. And on the Holy right, Christ. you have the Son. And then on the left, you have the Holy Spirit. So this one, which is bigger, represents Jesus Christ. Okay? So if you see that in other cathedrals, that might be one of the explanations for it. Okay? That's how religion will affect, influence architecture. Alright? It is an active church. Okay? You hear the choir? Alright? So I'll give you now 15 minutes. So those who want to go into the church can do it. Alright? In 15 minutes, we're going to meet over there. Yes. 15 minutes, guys. I'm gonna be over there so you have time to go into the church, take pictures, and destroy the place. Alright?
Walk on the other side. Hmm? She go on the other side. Uh, one of the popes, a uh, few interpretations of the scriptures of painting some of the kings. They're having a party down that block. <laughs> Get the inscription. 
And ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm gonna cut the footage because of my cam my camera slash battery is about to die. So I will talk to you guys later. This is gonna be a review of Reservoir Dogs. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Hopefully I do this edit of all the videos correctly and talk to you later. Peace.